Welcome guys to the CFT Baking Show. Thank you for coming today. We're gonna get together and bake some thick, consistent BCFT anomalies. But first off, before we start mixing everything, let's just remind ourselves what is it we're baking exactly. Conformal anomaly is a classical dish of CFT practitioner. It's the trace of a stress tensor which does not vanish in a curved space. In 4D, you've got your anomaly coefficient without a boundary, which are C and A, and they have interesting properties to classify CFTs, and they give us non-perturbative information on different theories. C and A are related to the two-point and three-point function coefficient of a stress tensor, and they've got interesting properties among which they flow monotonously for A, and A does not depend on a marginal coupling. When we add a boundary, we add some tanginess to the mix by giving us new structure to play with, which give a boundary localized contribution to a trace anomaly. In 4D with a 3D boundary, you've got a term which is proportional to A, and you've got two new terms, B1 and B2, which depend on the extrinsic curvature and the vial tensor. B1 and B2 are related to the two-point and three-point function coefficient of a new operator, which is called D. It's a displacement operator, and it's related to the loss of conservation of a stress tensor on the boundary. And our goal here would be to derive a sum rule which will constrain B1 and B2 in a consistent way for any theory. Great, now we can actually start to prepare our dish. So, we have a variety of dry ingredients and we're gonna take a look at each of them. First, there are correlators, then wide identities, and finally, conformal blocks. Let's inspect each of them closely. Correlators are the usual staple that gives taste to any CFT. In this project, we will concentrate on a very specific correlator, which is TDD. There is one bulk operator, the stress tensor, and two insertion of a displacement operator on the boundary. It can be constructed with two different tensor structures, Y2, Y3, and there is only one first ratio V. This correlation function is given by one overall kinematic factor, which are just some power laws, two functions of the cross ratio, and some tensor structure. Owing to the existence of a convergent boundary operator expansion, the stress tensor can be expanded as a sum of operators localized on the boundary, the first of which is the displacement operator, followed by a tower of spin 2 operators. From there, it follows that you can write these functions in terms of a distinguished basis using conformal partial waves with overall coefficients which depend solely on the CFT data of the theory you're looking at. The output of this is that alpha and beta contain information about the three-point function CDD. Wide identities are the operator translation of conformal invariants. Though they are often written as some contact point normalization condition, we preferred for them an integral form which we now derive first without a boundary. We will consider some very general correlation function which is made up of some field insertion at different distinct points in spacetime and living in a manifold with some non-trivial metric on it. We will now perform a conformal transformation, which is a subset of a diff and vial transformation of this correlation function. Knowing how the field insertion transform, we can relate this to a change in the background geometric quantities, which define insertion of some local operators, here the stress tensor. If we want to only perform transformation on a subset of the insertion points, we can do so by using a topological operator. The idea is that we will have an operator which will live on some surface sigma, which encloses a region B, and we will perform a conformal transformation on all of the insertion points which are inside B. And the idea is to look at this surface integral of a stress tensor which depends on a conformal scaling vector, and this operator, by definition and by using the previous relation, can be shown to actually perform this conformal transformation on the subset of points which are in the inside of B. And this shows us how T actually encodes a local conformal transformation, hence it can be integrated out. In the presence of a boundary, the situation is quite similar, though there are some complications brought about by the variety of new structures which can be localized on the boundary. For example, we can have a metric on the boundary, we can have a variation which sources some vector operator which depends on the normal to the boundary, and we can also have contribution from the extrinsic curvature. And this is, of course, a big mess. However, this simplifies greatly when we consider some conformal transformation which actually B 
preserve a boundary where most terms actually drop out and we only get contribution from the operators, the stress tensor T and the boundary stress tensor tau. We can now construct a new surface operator which will implement local conformal transformation on a subset of a point, but we only have to take care that the volume that we enclose can also touch the boundary where there can be some insertions. So here's a picture of how it looks like visually. We've got some domain beta which can touch the boundary. There's some surface sigma in the bulk which has some boundary which is this line gamma. And we have to insert the stress tensor over this surface sigma and assert the boundary stress tensor over this boundary of sigma, this gamma line. It then follows that this topological operator actually implements conformal transformation correctly on all points, both in the bulk and on the boundary. So again, we, T can be integrated out. This is quite strange because we have two types of tensor, tau and T. However, a quick look at the wide identity actually tells you that tau is generically non-conserved because it recombines with some contribution coming from the bulk stress tensor. Meanwhile, T is still conserved away from the boundary and the non-conservation is related to the displacement operator. The strategy to derive a sum rule is now to consider this topological operator applied to a two-point function dd with a dilatation. Then rewriting this in terms of a correlation function tdd that we wrote before and looking at a convenient parametrization, we can actually derive some integral formula that relates alpha and beta to the CFT data of this boundary stress tensor tau and of the two-point function coefficient of the displacement operator. Given the block, we can now compute this integral. Of course, this wouldn't work without some of the added magic brought about by the conformal blocks. They make for a fluffy sum rule. Conformal blocks are entirely kinematic objects totally fixed by conformal symmetry. They form a complete basis of functions for correlators and they are eigenfunctions of a conformal Casimir operator and, most importantly for us, they admit an integral representation. Here, if we look at the specific conformal partial waves on the exchange of some operator of dimension delta and spin L, which is this W function, this can be written as the integral of lower points function soon together where one of the operator is the operator that we're looking at and the other is the exchange of a shadow operator which has dimension d minus one minus delta and on top of it you have some normalization coefficient n which is proportional to some of the coefficients and some other kinematically determined factors and p which is a projection on some polynomial subspace which is some uh, formal uh, procedure in practice, these integrals are very complicated to compute, and to actually do them, we go to the embedding space, where it is efficient to do so using Feynman parameters and a single integral identity. Now, this wouldn't make a dish alone, so don't forget to add in your wet ingredient that will bind it all together. Embedding space. Conformal symmetry is so important, it should be obvious. The idea is that you will write generic points in Rd, using some null vectors in R1, d plus 1. So you uplift the manifold that you want to evaluate your CFT in on the projective light cone. Then your fields are also uplifted and in the light cone they obey some generic scaling properties. Tensor fields are uplifted to transverse tensors which can be encoded in some index free formalism by contracting all of their free indices with a dummy polarization variable z which obeys some further property that it squares to zero and that it's transverse to p. Conformal invariance is then just the statement of Lorentz invariance in this bigger space and correlation functions are easy to write. Likewise, we can consider integrals over all of the space of conformal wave minus d functions which are mapped in the embedding space to conformally invariant integral over the light cones which are rather more easy to compute. We will see actually that these conformal integrals map both to the conformal partial wave expansion and to perturbative expansion under marginal deformation of your theory. Now that all of our ingredients are ready, you just mix them together in a big bowl and you make sure that they combine well.
to get better intuition on our wired identity and actually check that it's old, we can do explicit computation in a simple mode. And this is the free Invalberg boson whose correlation function is given by the usual power law one can expect, plus some reflection coefficient, which can be plus one for Neumann boundary condition and minus one for Dirichlet boundary condition. Our wired identity actually implies that this coefficient has to square to one in three theories. However, since the BOP of phi can only contain two protected scalars, var phi one and var phi two, one can try to perturb the theory by actually coupling a scalar which is in directly on Neumann boundary condition to the other boundary scalar that does not appear in its spectrum. And one can compute the CFT data as a function of this coupling and check that our wild identity actually holds away from the trivial limit. Now take a big dollop, put it in a hot pan with ton of butter and ta-da, you've got a sum roll. Now that we are confident in the identity we derived, we can actually plug in the formula for the blocks that we computed using embedding space conformal integrals. And now it's a matter of collecting all of the computation and looking at it for d equals 4 in 3D boundary to actually get a constraint on the possible anomaly coefficients. This equation actually shows us that b1 is generically different than b2, which we expected. However, it gives a good handle to discuss qualitatively what happens when we add in SUSY to the mix or whether we can bound the difference in magnitude between the two anomaly coefficients.